Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today will be Mitch Light. We recorded the show on Monday afternoon. We are going to air it late Tuesday evening. We thank our presenting sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center. Wellspire offers personal and professional development opportunities in a beautiful facility in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host an off-site event that will wow your team or your clients. We also thank our co-presenting sponsor, The Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. Today's news presented by Sutherland & Belk, a Nashville-based injury law firm. Sutherland & Belk is committed to fighting for those who have been injured in car, motorcycle, and truck accidents. Check them out at sbinjurylaw.com. The NCAA has ruled on spring sports. Players will get an extra year of eligibility. That has huge ramifications for baseball. Seniors can come back, get another year. Everybody else gets a year deferred. Meanwhile, the draft will have a big effect on things, too. We will talk about about that in future podcasts as that story develops. Our guest line, presented by Bowling Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I had no clue what I was missing with Bowling Branch sheets till I got them. They are fair trade certified, which means they are made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them free for a month. You can return them, but you will not want to. Once you get these sheets, try the mattress. That was voted the best mattress of 2018. Go to BowlingBranch.com. That is spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Mitch Light joins us from The Athletic. Of course, you know him. as a sideline reporter for Vanderbilt football and many other things associated with Vanderbilt sports over the years. Mitch Thank you for joining us. I hope you and your family are doing well. Doing fine, Chris. Thank you, and good to be here. How stir crazy have you gone around your house? Um, not as much as I would have expected, because I'm actually kind of um, not a homebody. Like to get out and do things. In fact, going and we probably talked about this, but going back a few months when I made the decision to work from home at the Athletic. Um, I was surprised that I enjoyed working from home as much as I did. So I kind of got into rhythm working from home, but then obviously can still go out and do things. So I just not being able to go out to dinner or just go shopping or, you know, do the normal stuff is, is, uh, is, is not been fun, but uh, I've actually dealt with it better. You know, my kids are older, as we talked about before we, we started recording, they don't need constant supervision. My daughter's in college, so she's busy taking her classes and, uh, um, you know, I've been staying very busy with work and, you know, not an ideal situation. But the one thing about this one, we are all in this together. I know that sounds corny, but it's like the, it does no good to complain because everyone's dealing with it. It kind of feels bad to complain about any hardship when people are getting sick and dying and things like that. I mean, we're like you said, we're all in this together. We're all probably going a little nuts at times, but certainly for both of us, it could be tons worse than it is. Exactly, exactly. So just uh, just trying to make the best out of a bad situation. Before we get to Vanderbilt in particular, what of interest is catching your eye in the world of sports? And if people don't know, you're the editor for the state of Tennessee, so you see all sorts of stories through The Athletic, which you guys continue to do good work. What are the most intriguing things out there? I mean, particularly college sports related, but just anything that you were seeing that comes across your desk or that you're reading? Well, there's no games, obviously, so there's nothing intriguing. I mean, I, I think the – and I guess that there's a vote later today, the ongoing um, debate about what's going to happen with guys, uh, uh, seniors – or not just seniors, but eligibility for spring sports participants in college sports and and, and, and what that will look like as far as if guys – uh, women, men and women get an extra year of eligibility and, and then sports that aren't fully funded like baseball has the financial aid part come in rosters so i mean i think that's a, that's a huge issue um that's going to affect uh, a, a lot of teams a lot of kids i mean you're 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 in effect could have five years of athletes um competing for 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 fewer you know roster spots fewer starting positions and all that but i, I am of the feeling that a lot of these kids in, you know, the Olympic sports 
while it sounds good to come, you know, hey, we get an extra year of eligibility. Now, obviously, this affects the underclassmen if they get an extra year of eligibility, not just the seniors. But I don't think a ton of seniors actually would come back because if you're a an Olympic sport athlete at a, you know at a you know Division one school, but a smaller you know smaller school, you're in the SoCon, you're in the Patriot League. Um, are you going to come back and keep training, assuming you're not a professional athlete or an Olympic caliber athlete? Are you going to keep training, go back to school, pay some uh, for a whole nother year just to compete next spring? It's not like football where they'd be competing in the fall and they can be done and go four and a half years. So that's probably a long winded way of saying that. But uh, I think that would be interesting to watch. Now, now, if you're an underclassman, you get that extra year of eligibility and you can plan and you're on scholarship uh, or you can you know, graduate and then get an extra year for that for graduate school. That's a great deal there. So I think that'll have a huge impact and it's a big headache for for coaches to figure that out. Um, you know, other than that, really, Chris, not, not a lot. Obviously, you know, NFL's got free agency, uh, which is kind of the, the going on and giving giving those of us that cover this or write about this, edit this stuff. Uh, so some the only slice of normalcy really in college in, in sports right now to me is kind of what's going on in the NFL. It just occurred to me as we're talking through this, I wonder how big a difference there will be in decision-making between kids who can come back who are like full pays. In other words, if you're on full scholarship for football and can come back, or on the other hand, if you're doing something else that's not that and your family's income's getting impacted, your parents' ability to pay for it, whatever, that could be another factor in there. I don't know how big a factor it'll be, but that's something. I mean, because honestly, economics is going to end up controlling so much of this anyway. Right. I mean, that is kind of my point. Well, you know, football doesn't matter because no one's getting an extra year of eligibility for football, um, assuming that they play, play football this fall. But it's, you know, spring sports, the two major sports in college athletics are football and basketball. Baseball is getting there and it's a revenue sport at a lot of schools, but it's a, it's not a fully funded sport. But you've got men's and women's tennis, you've got golf, you have all the, you know, track and field, you have all this stuff. And, in, in net, you know, the commercial, it's even more so when you fact take football, basketball, like what, you know, whatever the percentages, these kids aren't going pro. Um, so if you're at Bucknell, sorry, my phone was ringing. If you're at Bucknell, uh, just picking a school that I had and you're a tennis player, yeah, it's great if, you know, you can play your senior year again, but you're probably paying, you might be paying $35,000 a year in part financial aid and stuff. And you're, you're, you're graduating. Are you going to come back to play? Probably not. So, you know, it, it's a good deal. It'll affect baseball a lot because kids could come back as juniors again and keep their leverage and all that. But I, I don't think it's going to affect as many kids or I don't think as many kids are going to take advantage of that second senior year as maybe people think without, you know, haven't really thought this thing through. The baseball draft thing, has that been settled yet? Because I know it sounded like they were moving towards, I think, a 10-round draft, but I don't think that's been decided yet, has it? There's been some de- final decisions been made that was open-ended. I think it can be as few as five rounds, no more than 10, and I don't want to really speak out of turn here because I'm like with you, I, I haven't – there were some major headlines last week. I didn't read all of it because uh, it looked like it wasn't set. But uh, if and when they do the draft, I think it's going to be capped at 10 rounds, which obviously is a, it's a huge deal because it's usually, what, like 30 or 40 rounds? It's 40, and baseball is the wild card to me just between the draft and what you said about spring sports. I mean, I'm really having a hard time getting my head around what could be coming next with that because there's just implications all over the place and implications from those implications. Yeah. And it's, you know, kind of what we mentioned before, it's, it's the financial aid part of it is, you know, one thing that I've seen, I've seen thrown out there is if you are um, a senior and you are on, let's just say 25% financial aid that you can come back for another senior year and you're on 25% financial aid again, but that that 25% does not count against the 11.7. That this, that just, uh, basically just, I don't know the way, the way to phrase it just kind of sits out there and doesn't, it's sort of like salary cap in, in professional sports, it doesn't go against your cap. Um, so and that's something that could possibly happen. But, you know, you think about in college baseball, for the most part, most seniors are not big prospects. If they were, they'd already be gone. So do those guys want to come back? And most of them are paying some money, just sort of like my thought in the other sports, you know, as much as, Harrison Ray loves college baseball, loves playing for Vanderbilt. Is he going to come back 
um, go through a whole nother year school wise. You know, you'd assume he was on pace to graduate. Um, does he get into grad school? Does he take more undergraduate stuff? Uh, you know, I don't know how that would all work. So I'm just using, like I said, using him as an example. So it's not a slam dunk just because, oh, you can come back to college that you're going to come back. Um, as you guys do your job, obviously everybody's world is uncertain. Do you guys spend a lot of time as a staff, or maybe this goes over your head, looking at medical opinions and trying to figure out what comes next? Not, not down in my level, <laughs> you know, um, I know the, you know, the, the editors, the main editors, the editor, editor in chief, editorial director and all that stuff. I'm sure they are, as they plan, make long-term plans, they're, they're looking at that stuff and, you know, but we're just, I mean, no one really knows. There's so many different opinions out there and, and I value like most of us, the medical uh, uh, opinions and the, the, the scientists and all that, but they don't know people can forecast things, but you know, I think the job, our job at the athletic has been just trying to keep put out as much good sports content as possible, balancing actual covering the teams that we cover like free agency and in football and then the, the ever te- evergreen type content that we're working on. Um, you know, the more big picture features and stuff like that. So, um, to specifically answer your question, not, not, not in the, not in the, like this, the staff that I work with. Let's talk Vandy hoops, Aaron Neesmith and Saban Lee making respective announcements about going to the draft. What are your thoughts on those? You know, no surprise on uh, Neesmith at all. You know, when you, when you get into the, uh, level where he's projected to go it's not even like he's a fringe first rounder like earlier in the year you saw him in most mocks in the 20s and then you know maybe he wasn't in all of them now he seems to be in the teens and climbing um with his skill set and, and um so you know a, a no-brainer there Saban Lee was mildly surprised um you know I think he will play professional basketball I think he will be in the NBA at some point um he uh, you know, needs to develop a, a more consistent jump shot, I think, to be a long term NBA player or a, you know, more than a just a into the bench. He has a skill. I mean, he's an NBA athlete without a doubt. He has a skill um, and that he can get to the basket on, uh, you know, against anyone as good as any player I've ever seen at Vanderbilt, almost as good as any players I've seen on the coll- collegiate levels just getting to the basket. Um, so, you know, it's sort of the climate we live in, the culture of college basketball, you know, three after three years, almost you just don't, I, I guess I, I'm not surprised based on the, the situation. Um, you know, he's had, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the, you know, the bad luck that he's had to endure at Vanderbilt with, with the injuries and things not working out team wise. I'm not surprised he, he's moving on. I know he, you know, technically has, you know, open the door to return. I guess he hasn't signed with an agent, but I think most of us think he, he will not be back. So um, would have loved to see him back. It's obviously a big blow, a tough blow to the team, uh, but I'm not necessarily surprised, that surprised by the move. Yeah, I would be very surprised if Saban Lee is back at Vanderbilt next year, uh, just based on the little background I've gotten there. But we were discussing before this for something else, Aaron Neesmith and Saban Lee, their careers before we started the podcast – it's really hard to articulate where those guys go down in Vanderbilt basketball history because Aaron obviously was a great player but contributed almost nothing to winning. Not his fault, but, you know, the circumstances. And Saban kind of became a one-man show about every other night at the end of the year, but not a lot to show for it. So it's going to be interesting to see how history – Judges those two players as we move on. Yeah, I, I will remember Saban Lee as one of the more fun players to watch as far as, the, you know, delivering highlights and, and wow plays at Vanderbilt. He's he's pretty high up that list. Now, he hasn't, like we said, he hasn't been a part of m- much winning. Not his fault. He's a very good player who would have been a very, very good starting point guard on some, you know, any good team around the country. Um so I will, you know, remember him fondly. You know, he's, like I said, a very good player and a, a, with kind of a, a unique skill set, especially for Vanderbilt. Neesmith's the one, like like we both said, you know, I don't, I don't know how he'll be remembered. He was a, you know, good, great shooter who was had as good of a half year 
shooting the basketball as we've ever seen at Vanderbilt. And that's saying something because Vanderbilt has been produced, you know, Vanderbilt's been known for shooters. It's produced great shooters and it was done in the non-conference portion of the schedule. So you got to take factor that in. It wasn't done against an SEC schedule, but he, again, he had as good of a, whatever it was, six or eight week stretch shooting the basketball, high volume shooting as we've ever seen at Vanderbilt. Um, so, um, you know, yeah, you, you can't, I don't think you can put him on any list of all time greats at Vanderbilt, no matter what he does. If he was, if he's the 10th pick in the draft, I still don't think you can put him on that list because he wasn't here long enough, didn't play enough games. And the one year he did play, the team did not win an SEC game. Now that wasn't his fault. Um, he, he battled and he was a good player. He wasn't a great player yet. Like he was this year. So, you know, I don't know the answer to, to how history will judge him. It's going to be really weird, potentially 10 years from now, if somebody knowing what we would know at that point about Lee Neesmith and Darius Garland saying, okay, these guys are all starting for Vanderbilt um, <laughs> in 2018, 2019. If you know nothing else, how does that end? That's just going to be like a, that would be a really weird hypothetical discussion in the future, I think. Yep. I mean, you said it right there. I mean, they didn't start a lot of games together. I actually, Neesmith probably didn't start with those guys, but they were on the same team um, for for a portion. And you know, it's uh, we don't know what 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 the sports landscape will look like in that in ten years. But uh, again, you, if you if you're watching an NBA game and in like I said six seven eight years, and you see all three of those guys maybe in the same court together. And you look back and then look at the SEC record during that stretch. You you, you need some have some explaining to do. I'm just thinking back to all the things that have happened the last two to three years. And you obviously covered Vanderbilt for the student paper and ran the Commodore Report. Is this the two to three most, I guess, Twilight Zone-like period, year period in, in the history of Vanderbilt sports that you're, you've covered? I mean, there's been some weird stuff and some strange things, but just this last two to three years, I think, to me – probably takes the cake well i mean i would just <clears throat> i mean if you're gonna boil it down to basketball yes just the, the the bad luck leading to the winless season um you know there's been really nothing out of whack in the other sports football has not been very good but that you know based, since i've been around Vanderbilt, that's usually the the case it's not out of what it's not out of uh or it's not un, you know um you know uh, what's the word I'm looking for out of the ordinary for, for, for the football program to struggle. So I, you know, um, and when you factor in baseball, it's been as good as it's been any time period there. So I, I just think it's the, the basketball program is just, um, it's been a perfect storm that's led, that's led to this situation. So, um, you know, again, you, you, you take, you take the, those, you take all the signings, that have happened and you say, yeah, that's a good signing. I'll take that. And we've talked about this. You, you take the Bryce Drew higher. You, you, you probably, you make that higher again on paper. You make that higher, except I would want to go back and uh, this is revisionist history. And I'm not really answering your question, but revisionist history. I looked at Bryce Drew's record and I talked about this a lot with you. You don't, you don't have that kind of record in conference play for that many years, as well like Valparaiso would not be a good coach. That's what I thought going in. I would want to know from a coach or someone else to do my research, why were his teams successful? Were they only successful because he had better players or did he out coach people? If you find out, well, he always had better players, then I might hit the pause button and say, okay, Vanderbilt, you're, you're I know they signed Darius Garland. I get that. You're generally not going to have, a top three roster in the SEC. So you'd rather have a guy who can coach him up. That's where I fought the Bryce Drew hire. But, you know, I'm like not, not necessarily from his resume. Um, so, you know, again, so you, you, you take all the signings, you probably make the, the, the hires that you just, you're just kind of in the position you're in through some bad luck with injuries and uh, a guy just turning out not, not to be as good a coach as you thought he'd be. Well, I think adding to the weirdness, too, this is part of what I did not express. You're also at a period where in 13 months, you literally had three ADs, too. Yeah, I don't know how that affected the basketball program of, of the higher. I mean, obviously, Jerry Stackhouse is not – sorry, my phone is not, is not, the, is not the, uh, the coach of Vanderbilt without Malcolm Turner just because of their uh, – you know. but, you know, if Bryce Drew is living up to his expectations – 
he's having a good year last year and new AD comes in and everything's great. And then, you know, and then if Malcolm Turner doesn't work out, if, if, if the, the basketball program's doing fine, like the programs that are doing well aren't affected by the athletic director change. You can look at it. So I, again, I'm kind of rambling here, but I, I don't think that's affected really the basketball program in, in the, in the short term. Well, no, I meant just to more the whole picture. It's like, okay. if we've got a national title on one hand you know, football went from, hey, things are kind of looking up here a little bit with the big three to it falling off a cliff to the losing streak in basketball. You know, women, it just has been a just a very bizarre, hot and cold set of circumstances on the whole. Yeah, um, I always joke that when Bill Trosh and I did the common report in the late 90s, it was, you know, you look back and the football, it was among, there was a five and six year under, under Woody, but it was among the five worst, one of the worst stretches of Vanderbilt football that coincided with one of the best stretches of Tennessee football <clears throat> and the basketball program was okay. You know, Dan Van Bredekoff, um made the tournament one time. They were rarely bad, rarely good, just sort of average there. So, uh, you know, the, I'd say the late nineties was not uh, an ideal stretch either. Back to Bryce Drew. I'm going to just try this on for lack of a better explanation. See what you think. It's almost like, you know, you have some players that are superstars at AAA, but for whatever reason, it never translates to the majors. I think like in the 80s, like Brad Comments. I think if you want to go a little more recently, Matt Laporta was a kid that we both saw play in the SEC. I thought that kid's going to be a really good big league hitter, but it never stuck. I wonder if Bryce was a guy, and remember, they use the international market a lot, so they really – say what you want to say about Bryce and those guys, but one thing uh, that – didn't lack with them was effort. I think they recruited and pursued players pretty hard. They had a lot of connections in Europe, and I think they were able to get players that in the Horizon League were really good players. I suspect that Bryce probably had more talent than the rest of those guys, and, and maybe coaching against the guys he coached against instead of Rick Barnes and Frank Martin and Ben Howland and whoever you want to name in the SEC. I wonder if there was some sort of like that triple a to major league wall in there where for whatever reason it just didn't translate yeah i mean that could be it and uh, you know you you made the point like just sometimes you got better players and and that's um and you know when you when you when you've got the better roster over an 18 game schedule year after year you're going to win more games so that's why i would you know really want to dive in and see what kind of stuff they run and does that translate well to Vanderbilt or the SEC and all that and um you know I, I just think and I I know basketball pretty well but I'm you know far from an X's nose genius I just watching this team this past year versus the team two years ago and I know there were you know X's and O's weren't everything. It was sort of like, how did Bryce Drew deal with the situation? Not as well as he should have, which led to the team not playing as well and not playing as hard. I get all that stuff. But I just thought that the team was so much better coached this year than last year. Um, and that's sort of like when you need the coaching part, your coaching acumen to come, to, you know, to, to show is when things aren't going well and, you, you know, you lose your – you, you know, your, your lottery pick point guard, what can you do to get shots for your guys? It's one, you know, we're kind of bouncing all over the place. It's one thing I always thought Kevin Stongs was so good at is he, all, I always trusted that I don't, the over, you could, you could look at the overall talent, a lot of other things, but I always trusted that he would get good shots for the right players and, and the offense would usually be pretty good. And I just, I never had that confidence with Bryce Drew. Yeah, I, mean, I feel like Jerry Stackhouse did a lot of really good things with development. I feel like what little you saw in Neesmith, he developed as a player. Certainly, it happened with Saban Lee. I thought that he got a lot out of Pippen. I mean, to me, that is definitely, so far, seems to be the strength of what he can do. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, and that's going to come down to overall talent level. Um which will, you know, obviously going forward, we'll have to see. But um, you, you, that's – I. This is kind of my opinion as, as as a fan of every team of of mine, professional college. It's like you just want to feel like your your coach is maximizing your talent. You never want to feel like you're you're underachieving or underperforming based on the talent you have. And I think that was, you know, unfortunately, I think that was the case um, during uh, Bryce Drew, especially that first year. They ended up rallying to make the tournament, but you look back, it was a pretty good team. Um, and they had to really, you know, end up getting an eight seed. I get it, but had to really get on a late season run to, to make the tournament. Back to Bryce a minute. I'm 
trying to rewind to Valpo and just think of like why it might have worked there. I mean, I think they had some Chicago connections uh, for one, the international connections. That's also a state in an area where you can probably recruit to. Indiana is a huge basketball state. And I wonder in that league – if maybe the home court advantage because of all that was maybe a little greater too. Possibly. Yeah. I mean, I think that's fair. And, you know, they've recently jumped leagues there in the Missouri Valley and they've been kind of struggling, but you know, the horizon is not as good of a league. Um, <clears throat> you know, in, you know, Oakland's been a good program. Wright state's been a good program, but you know, Youngstown state, Cleveland state struggling, you know, there's some programs in there with potential. So I'm giving credit. They, they won a lot of games. there. They're good players. And, you know, he was a good recruiter. So, um, they, I, you know, watching games there, I think they had a pretty good home court advantage and, you know, he had, he had a really good run there and I just, you know, he might do fine. He'd probably do well at Grand Canyon. He'll probably recruit well. And that the league's terrible. The whack, you know, New Mexico state's been dominating that league. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, you know, in a Metro area there, basically, even though it's called Grand Canyon University, it's in Phoenix or it's in, you know, it's it's in the Phoenix area. I'm not sure what Glendale maybe. Uh, I'm sure he'll be able to recruit there. Yeah, they have a good bit of money and a pretty decent base of well-heeled boosters from what I understand. Yeah, and they draw well. It's a, it's a weird school. It's a for-profit school. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weird situation there. I think that's the only for-profit school in the NCAA Division One, is it not? Yes, I believe it is. Yeah, but um, anyway, let's – anything else Vanderbilt-related before we go to the mailbag that you'd like to get into? Uh, not really. I'll tease something. You know, you always ask me at the end, but I'll, I'll tease something right now. I'm working on something that um, – it's got a Vanderbilt tie. It's the, the, the best college football players in the state of Tennessee all time based on uniform number, 1 through 99. So I've been wow. doing a ton of research this past week uh, about it and decent amount of Vanderbilt guys, as you'd suspect the most Tennessee guys out of the, out of the hundred guys, there's a ton of Tennessee guys, uh, but, but a lot of Vanderbilt there. And so just had some fun researching that, you know, some, some, some names from the past um, pop up, but you know, you can probably guess the usual suspects, but it's, it's hard because just because someone had, was a great player, you know, like the number 12, I was trading back and forth with the uh, MTSU athletic director, I mean, uh, media relations guy on some photos. And like Eric Walden is the number 43 from the state. We actually played for the Titans some. He's like, what about Bayer? What about, you know, Stockstill? And like, you know, number 12, two of the best players in MTSU history are Brent Stockstill, number 12, and Kelly Holcomb, number 12. Well, uh, you know. That's a quarterback number. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's Bill Wade, Vanderbilt. Yeah. And then Marcus Nash is actually the best Tennessee player. So it's like, just because you're a great player, it depends what number you're at, you know. So if you ever want to get for the young people out there, if you ever want to get on a list like this, pick a weird number. So was this just college? Yes, just college. College football players who played in the state. And, and I've, got a, I've got a Carson Newman guy on this list. A lot of Tennessee State. You know, Tennessee State's probably third after Vanderbilt. Um because they, you know, an unbelievable run there in the mid, uh, in the seventies and eighties. Oh yeah, Claude Humphrey, Too Tall Jones, Joe. G- I mean, they had TSU. I think for the level it is, what they put out in football talent is pretty astonishing from what they did in the sixties and the seventies and yeah, look, part in the eighties. Google or Wikipedia, John Merritt, an unbelievable run there. Yeah, speaking of which, were you guys on your? You're number 25 for your Hall of Fame. Oh, I just posted today. Jeff Fisher beat Mookie Betts for for the number 25 spot in our, our we did it. We did a the fan voting for the reader voting for the number the 25th spot in our the Athletic Nashville Sports Hall of Fame, and Jeff Fisher got the 25th spot. That was a tough one. I gotta say, how do you leave out a member of the baseball hall of fame, though? That one puzzled me a little bit. Yeah. I mean, um, if you voted, you were the only vote for him. What was his name again? Turkey Stearns. Well, yeah. this is this was my case, okay? Yeah, it was a valid case, but go ahead and make well, it. Well, Bill James in his 2001 baseball abstract said he was one of the 25 best baseball players ever. Now, maybe with some guys having careers, that puts him, who knows, 30, 35. And, I mean, even if, even if you overrated him, let's say he's still top 50 or 60, I would just think a top 50 or 60 player of all time – who is from Nashville, born here, lived here some, and actually played a season here, to me that's like a starting point not to put him in at the end. 
Yeah, I mean, very fair. You made a solid case. And, you know, if we were doing a 25th, the, the one guy that I think we met, we whipped on, I'll be honest, was John Merritt. Again, I just yeah, talked about him. I yeah. knew he was good. I didn't realize how good he was. Um, and Turkey Stearns right there. There's a lot of good candidates. Well, and I'm doing the same thing with the Vandy Sports 100, which you're giving me a little bit of feedback on. That's going to get rolled out through the spring and summer. And uh, this is easier because I can go look at rosters and stat sheets and things like that. And, like, I've got three sports and just pick the players from there from the time period to 03 present. And, like, you can leave stuff. Like, I almost forgot, for whatever reason, I left Will Toffee off my original list. And I remembered it and I put him back. So, like, I, I don't think I'll miss anybody. But the thing is, so many sports and so many angles. Like, I'll give you another one. Um, and I don't think he would have been in your top 25. But Mark Grace, I think, was born here and, and played some Little League ball here. I don't know if that's a name that ever came yeah, up in your discussion. Yeah, we kind of go through high school at least. Okay, so yeah, and that's where parameters get tough. Like, or, you know, does Willie McGee get discussed because he played with the Sounds for a year? Um, stuff yeah, like that. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I would say no. And like, someone mentioned Paul Correa because he's an NHL Hall of Famer, but like he played here for two years. Yeah, you've got to have limitations on like how long was the guy here and how long did he play and was he minor league? I mean, that's that's a challenging task. And I guess the point I was getting at is it like. Just there's so many ways. You know, like there might be a bowler or something like that that you didn't know was from that. There's like there's so many ways that you can miss with that list. That might be interesting to to redo in five or ten years. Um, is is you process like you know what you've done and maybe guys who like like probably five years from now, Mookie Betts is in that list. Right. That, That'll yeah, be fun to see if you guys make that a running sort of thing over the years. Well, hopefully, you know. I'm only half kidding. Hopefully there's not a pandemic in three years that we have to do all this, you know, evergreen content. Well, that's the one blessing in this is I'm now getting to do some stuff like that, like the podcast I did with Carson Fulmer on Monday and the list I'm coming up. It does free up some time to do those kind of bucket list projects you've wanted to do for a while. Yeah. Again, let's let's hope this is a one-time deal, though. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Our mailbag is sponsored by Simply a Fan. And Mark Gent, Mark organizes road trips to sporting events across the country. He's doing so for several Vanderbilt baseball road series this year, at least would have been had there been a baseball season. Anyway, you can go to Simply a Fan and get more information. Tell them you heard about it on the podcast. And I think that if the MLB season gets back underway, Mark should be doing some trips there. Okay, this one from Raiders 1967. Most memorable cover shot was a picture of Jared McGrath uh, in a 1999 home game against UGA heading for a touchdown that never happened. He, of course, is speaking of your work with the Commodore Report. It says, can't remember the exact words on the cover, but it conveyed the message of what might have been. The 99 season was so close to a bowl game. Can you discuss your memories of that team and of that game? Yeah, what game was he talking about? I was my, my I was thinking when he... Um, I think read, that read was the, start, the read, read, read I think, the start of the question again. Well, he was referring to a picture of Jared McGrath on the cover of the Commodore Report, right? In the home game against Georgia, I believe that was the okay, yeah, okay, the Georgia game. fake punt game. I, I think, yeah, if yes, my memory is yeah. correct. Okay, so, um, actually, I've thought about that team a lot more recently for two reasons. One, Woody, you know, dying, um, and then this project I'm working on, I've been diving into all eras of Vanderbilt football, you know? Um, so that was, you know, that was a good team that, that, that probably was definitely good enough to go to a bowl game, you know, ended up five and six losing that Kentucky game to when Rodney, um, um, Williams, Williams fumbled. Now that was the year of 11 games. If you play 12 games and you've got an easy non-conference schedule, that um, easy or non-conference game, that team wins six games and goes to a bowl game. So it's a different era as before the 12 games uh, where you just had to go six and six. Had had a good, you know, some really standout defensive players like Jimmy Williams, Matt Stewart, Nate Morrow, Jamie Winborn, um, a good quarterback in Zolman. You know who had a really a very good career, a much better career than I remember, and he, he's the number 85 on that list that I was talking about, is Dan Stricker. Yeah, Dan Stricker had a great career. Tavares Hogan's, Todd Yoder. No, Yoder, yeah, Yoder, I think, was still on the team. Um, so, yeah, that, that was a good team. That was a really good Vanderbilt team with some good talent. We had a good recruiting, uh, recruiting year. So that was a fun year. It was a fun team to cover um, that just, you know, the so many what-ifs. Could have, would have, should have the Georgia game. The Kentucky game, 
you know, very, I'd have to go back and look, but very rarely, I think, in fact, I'm going to try and, is that the year the close loss to Florida? I've got very the season in front of me. Um, let's see. They, they lost to Alabama 28-17 out of the gate. I think that's the game where um, Sean Alexander went nuts. They follow up. They win three in a row over Northern Illinois, Ole Miss, Duke, get blown out to miss, against Mississippi State, beat the Citadel, lose 27-17 to then number 14 Georgia, beat South Carolina in an 11-10 thriller, lose 13-6 to to Florida, 19 to 17 to Kentucky and then 38 to 10 to Tennessee. Yeah, so basically only lost two games by more than the Alabama game is 11 points. Only lost two games by more than 11 points. We're very rarely, you know, you know, very rarely outclassed that season. That that was that was a good team and a, a fun team like I said. Yeah, that was a fun team. They did some interesting things at times. Um could be fun to watch on offense. That's one of those um, the twelfth game has just changed so much. I mean, you schedule. Well, let's see. They they beat Northern Illinois by three. That was the Jimmy Williams game, I believe. Yeah, it's a punt return. Yes, right. So there was that. So they they scheduled the built-in win with the Citadel. They did get that. Uh, the other non-conference game was Duke, which wasn't very good at the time. I mean, if you could put in a, you know, I I don't know a. MTSU or well, that's probably not the right one because Middle was pretty good at the time as as they found out within a couple of years, um, but that's one where you have the opportunity now to schedule a fourth game outside the league of a team you can beat, and I mean, you know, you just you just put one of those on there, get a UNLV or somebody like that. Again, bad analogy for now, but uh, just schedule a win somewhere, and that season's remembered very differently if you can have twelve games under these conditions. Totally. And Woody's viewed differently, the whole, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it really changes the trajectory of animal football, but it, it, it changed the narrative of, you know, I guess the team, it took another, uh, another nine years to get to a bowl game to snap that streak. Well, I wonder how much it changes recruiting. Yeah. Cause he was a good recruiter. If he could have built off a bowl game, you know, it, you know, you, you never know. Yeah. I mean, speaking of which, did we talk about Woody last week? I don't think we did. I don't think so. Yeah, I think I don't think he had passed at that point. That was not when I was covering Vanderbilt football. I started again, I think as people know, in 03. But just give us your memories of him as a coach and your interactions with him. I know we've dove into that at various points of the podcast, but what's just kind of like your your best memories of him or your – maybe most telling memories of him is a better way to put it. I uh, loved Woody. <laughs> he was great. Uh, personally gave us great access. Uh, Bill and I were doing the common report, you know, just would tell us anything we wanted to know. Sometimes he was too honest. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's funny. I think we did a Q and a with him when he got the job. And I think Bill asked the question He's like, you know, what are some of your weaknesses or something, you know, you got to get better at. I forgot how to phrase the question. He's, he's like, oh, probably like organization. And it just like I think that was part of his downfall. I don't think he was very organized. Uh, you, you know, you, you you hear the certain coaches that come into the like the James Franklin who shows up with with a, a binder that you know hundred pages and plans and this and you know I I don't think Woody had binders. I think he just it was all in his head and he just ran things the way he wanted to run them. And he was a good defensive coach and a good recruiter and the guys liked him. I just think there was that attention to detail that was missing, probably that you really need to be successful, especially at Vanderbilt. Um, um, so, I mean, I think that was kind of his undoing. And um, like we just talked about, he had this kind of was building a little bit. I guess 98 was his first 97. Yeah, 97 was his first year as the head coach. Um had that great defense. The 98 team wasn't really very good. And then I kind of built towards 99. And if that would have worked out, um, like we just said, and broken through and got to a bowl game, who knows what would have happened. But, um, you know, he, he liked, he, he liked Vanderbilt. He really liked it here. He, he, his, his heart was in the right place. He had great intentions. He just was a little, like I said, just the, not very detail oriented, and especially the way you see all these maniacal, I don't know if that's the way put it, a bad way to put it. Head coaches now who just eat, sleep, and, and live the job. That w- that was not Woody, and 
Um, I don't know if that's why he didn't have didn't ultimately have success here. Uh, but you know, I'm glad he was the head coach at Vanderbilt, even though it didn't work out for him. And, and you know, I was sorry to see her, see the, the that he died. You weren't still covering them in one were you? Uh, no, we we did the common report from '96 to the '96 season through the, I think through the 2000 season. Well, I mean, of course, you're still connected. That again, that was before I was covering. Like, I remember my defining moment. That was his last season. Was them just going and being completely uncompetitive in the swamp, getting beat seventy-one to thirteen. What was it that just kind of caused the wheels for him to fall off at the end? If you know. Yeah, I, I don't know specifically. Again, we stopped covering the team, and and um, I don't know if that was Zong. Who was a quarterback in that year? Um, um was Zolman? Was it his senior see. year? Cutler came in in 03. No, Cutler no, was oh two. So that would have been Zolman's senior year, yes. Yeah. So I mean still had a decent quarterback. Um I don't remember. Tell you, you know, I I think probably a lack of maybe, you know, I, I don't this isn't fair. You ask some of the players on that team. Maybe a little lack of accountability and like when things are going fine, that's that's fine. But if things start to go poor, you maybe not as much of a disciplinarian as you needed to be. And then just things started spiraling out of control. But I, I don't really remember. Okay, I'm rewinding that season looking at it. They lose to middle 37-28 in the opener. And I totally forgot they lose 10-9 to to Alabama the next week in a game I don't remember at all. Uh, they beat Richmond. They lose by a field goal to Auburn. I want to say that was the Justin Perky game. Yes. Then they lose to number 19, Georgia, 30 to 14. They lose to number 16, South Carolina, 46 14. They beat Duke. Then they get throttled by Florida and then 56 to 30 by Kentucky, 38 0 to Tennessee. And then that old miss game, they lose 38 to 27. That was the rescheduled. Yeah. And had a big lead in that game. Yeah, so that was just a – you go back and look at that. A lot of times you, you get a break and win a game in there. Maybe the season turns out differently. But that just had to look at the end of a team that had packed it in in the last month. Yeah, and, I, you know, uh, you like you said, you win a couple of those games competitive early in the season and then just kind of, you know, started, you know, routinely – losing big and you know at that point i think that was his fifth year and kind of run its course and you know i, I think everyone if i recall correctly the, kind of the writing was on the wall there so you know it, it was no surprise when he was let go mitch we squeezed out 40 minutes today really to my surprise i uh, didn't know we'd have that much to talk about but it was a good conversation anything we didn't get into today that's worth discussing or anything with the athletic that's coming up that you'd like to promote? Uh, just like, again, the, um, the, the best uh, college football players in the state of Tennessee to wear each uniform number. been working on that. That was a fun project. I think that will be out Friday. Um, and just um, that's basically it. You know, we're trying to spit out as much good content, not just here locally in Nashville, but, uh, you know, nationally at the athletic. So check it out. And uh, that's basically it. All right, give me a teaser. What was the most random or maybe most uncompetitive number that you picked? Um, 61. Yeah. It that... came down to Gene Mosher at Vanderbilt and um, an offensive lineman at Middle Tennessee who – um, didn't even earn our conference honors. I forgot his name. And then my Gene Mosher, I texted a friend of mine who, who I know is on the 74 team. And I said, was Gene Mosher any good? He said, yeah, probably our best lineman. And he went, that was a bowl team. So that was good enough for me. Basically what happened, there was four numbers at Tennessee that were retired because those players did not come back from World War II. They died in World War II. So no one has worn them since. So usually at Tennessee, Tennessee's media guide was amazing, by the way, as far as the organization and, and finding numbers and stuff. So, like, you can always find a good Tennessee player as a default, like, oh, first team all conference or second team all conference. But 61 was one of those numbers where I couldn't. And then I looked at old Vanderbilt rosters and stuff and found that, again, Mosher was a 
starting offensive lineman who was a 50, didn't play in the NFL, but was a 15th round NFL pick. So again, my thinking was if you're the best offensive lineman on a bowl team at Vanderbilt and you were drafted, you're good enough for that list. Yeah, well, at least you weren't shooting a blank on that one. So yeah, so no, I mean, I got one for. There's some that I wasn't thrilled that I looked for better players, um, but I would say everyone on this list. Well, I know for a fact, other than maybe Gene Mosher was a was an All Conference player. Whether or not they, you know, got an Austin P guy, got a Carson Newman guy. You were a very good player if you made this list. Were there ever zeros or double zeros? No, I have no zeros. I don't think any college football players have worn zero. Maybe did I don't know what I'm saying. Did Itavius Mathers wear zero? Ah, boy, I don't remember that at all. Because I don't think, because uh, his name just came up a lot. No, he knew he wore number four. I remember zeros for basketball. Like Phil Cox was double zero back in the 80s. So there are in basketball, but football, I don't Saban remember Lee's call zero. zeros. Yes, Saban Lee's another one. But for, for whatever reason, they don't do that for football. I think football, you can't. Yeah, so. Which so. is odd because you need a lot more numbers in football. Yeah. So anyway, well, Mitch, thank you for joining us. Give out your Twitter handle and anything else before you leave today. All right. It's at Mitch Light. All right. That's plain and simple. Hey, thanks for joining us today. No problem. He is Mitch Light of The Athletic. I'm Chris Lee, the host of the Vanity Sports Podcast.